Good afternoon. Welcome to the ninth annual Norman E. Shumway Visiting Professor Lectureship. Thank you for joining us on this special occasion. Each year, this event is our department's most momentous occasion and celebration. For it is on this day that we celebrate the legacy of our department's founder, Dr. Norman E. Shumway. Dr. Shumway not only is the father of this department, but uh, the father of heart transplantation and a clinical pioneer in so many fields. Dr. Shumway was also a, a famous researcher and most importantly, Dr. Shumway was an educator who not only benefited the residents who had the privilege of training here at Stanford, but residents throughout the world who had the opportunity to thus learn from the Shumway tradition of the resident serving as the operating surgeon. As uh, the Shumway visiting professor, we are fortunate to welcome Dr. John Economides one of Stanford's most prominent residency graduates. Dr. Konamides uh, conducted his education and training first at the University of Toronto, where there are many noted figures familiar to us, such as Dr. Richard Wiesel and Dr. Tyrone David. And Dr. Konamides came here to Stanford and interacted with Dr. Shumway and Dr. Wright, Dr. Boyer, Mitchell, Miller, Burden, Fan, among many others. Dr. Konamides graduated from the program in 2000 and went to the Medical University of South Carolina where he has absolutely excelled and has risen to the division chief of cardiothoracic surgery where he has led his faculty in a period of tremendous cl clinical growth and to significant academic prominence. When we think of the term triple threat, we obviously think of Dr. Shumway, but no one embodies this term more than Dr. Economides. He is a very busy clinical surgeon and internationally renowned as a thoracic aortic surgery expert. He has a multi NIH R01 funded basic science research laboratory studying the cellular and molecular biology of aneurysm formation. And as an educator, he is nationally known and has chaired essentially every committee relating to teaching and education. Dr. Economides joins us from the uh, MUSC, and uh, it is my distinct privilege to welcome him as the ninth annual Norman E. Shumway lecturer. And as a housekeeping item, I welcome everyone here to join us in a group photograph on the stairs afterwards where we will remember this unique event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, I, I am I'm so honored and, and feel so incredibly privileged to be here today. And uh, I really have to thank all of you for coming. And um, when Joe uh, communicated with me and, and told me that um, I was going to be uh, able to give this lecture, I was, I was deeply moved and deeply honored and I really do have to express my sincerest appreciation to you for that. It's so wonderful looking out into the audience and seeing, uh, you know, incredible, incredibly talented residents and, and other uh, healthcare staff and also my mentors and friends. Um, it's, so, uh, it's so great to see you uh, today and thank you very much for coming. Um, so, I don't have any disclosures that are relevant to this presentation. And, what, and the reason we're here today is, is this. And um, he never trained me. I never did a case with Dr. Shumway <clears throat> in the operating room. But, um, you know, he, I met him when I interviewed here um, in 97, I guess, for the residency program, 96. Um, I would like to believe he had something to do with getting me into the program because at the time he and I had gotten into a discussion with uh, about Dr. Bigelow who was the old chairman at the University of Toronto and he was really the surgeon that inter introduced the idea of hypothermia to the world and they were friends and I think and I think that you know Dr. Bigelow wrote me a, a reference letter that I gave to Dr. Shumway that I would like to think had something to do with uh, with my being able to come to this incredible place. 
we spent some time together on the golf course and, and off the golf course and Dr. Shumway um, is just the kind of person that you just couldn't help but love and um, uh, always had the, a way of seeing the, the best or the funny side of a difficult situation. And he gave me great advice about life, about golf, about cardiac surgery. And uh, he's a special person to me. And uh, th this is just incredibly special for me. So what I would like to talk about today is I'd like to give you an overview on what's happening in the area of research in, in thoracic aortic disease. And um, I'd like to limit my talk really to the area of aneurysms. And my job today, I hope, is just to give you a, an overview over uh, in terms of what we've done, what we know, and, uh, and what, we, what we need to continue to do. So as many of you know, um, a thoracic aortic aneurysm is defined as, uh, as dilatation of the aorta to greater than one and a half times its baseline diameter. They're usually symptomatic during growth. And risk factors for aneurysms are very similar to other forms of heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, smoking, that sort of thing. But we, we still don't know what the pre precise stimuli are that, that, uh, that incite uh, aneurysm growth. There's a genetic predisposition disposition that comes into play in Marfan syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos, bicuspid aortic valves. But currently, we really don't have any non-invasive treatment options for this disease. We adopt a watch and wait surveillance program until essentially the, the risk of rupture outweighs the risk of surgical repair, and we undergo either open, open surgical repair, which is still associated with high morbidity and mortality, or in some cases endovascular stent grafting, which is clearly less morbid, but uh, its durability is uncertain and there is still a complication profile there. The fact of the matter is that we really do not have effective diagnostic modalities that allow us to identify patients with thoracic aortic disease or tract disease progression. And we have really no non-invasive interventional treatments available for these patients. So there is a, a, a significant need for further diagnostic and therapeutic advancement in many areas. So as I go through this talk, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on three broad areas, risk prediction for surgical therapy, biomarkers, and pharmacologic therapy. So let's talk about risk prediction. And unfortunately, this is a, a relatively short conversation. Um, how do we decide when to operate on patients? Well, we have data from Yale, and it's probably our best data, which show us the inflection points of complications relative to aneurysm size. So as you can see, for the ascending and the descending, there's an inflection point that occurs somewhere around five and a half centimeters. And this has resulted in us making broad recommendations to operate on patients at about this size. And this is also reflected um, in, the, in the incidence of, uh, of complications, specific complications, as you can see here by size. Um, a further advancement to this was the finding that, um, that smaller people with smaller aneurysms rupture at smaller sizes than larger people with larger aneurysms, which, which resulted in data such as, such as this, where we have uh, body surface area versus aortic size and, uh, uh, and an algorithm showing the risk of rupture from low, around 4% per year, all the way up to 20% per year. And essentially, once you get into this kind of moderate risk um, size versus diameter, you should start thinking about surgical therapy. Lastly, um, there's some, some data, not, not a lot of data, but some data that suggests that if you look at the cross-sectional area of the aorta, um, and you um, standardize this to the height of the patient, that in certain patient populations, for example, Marfan's and bicuspid aortic valves, there may be an argument for surgical intervention when this value exceeds 10. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, so honestly, we, we, we don't have, um, th th that's where we are. And, uh, and so you can see that in the, with all the technology that we have, we need to push this forward and we need, we need more data and we need to be able to characterize the disease of this, this aortic disease better than we are. So um, wall stress is, is an, interesting, uh, an interesting possibility. And here's a picture of uh, the abdominal aorta with an aneurysm. And you can see that it's possible to generate these stress maps where uh, low stress is in sort of bluish purple, high stress approaches orange and red. And you can see that there are various areas of stress within this aneurysm. Clearly, the wall stress increases as the size of the aneurysm increases. And this could be a very useful tool to predict the activity of the aneurysms and risk for, for rupture. Here's one with a patient with an ascending aortic aneurysm. I find this particularly interesting because look where the area of highest stress is. This is kind of on the lesser curvature, right where the, uh, right the non-left commissure is. 
And for those of us who do type A aortic dissections, you'll, uh, you'll recognize this as the area where the primary intimal tear usually is. And it's fascinating that this, that this stress map actually identifies the largest areas of stress on the lesser curvature of the aorta and specifically focused right there. And here's an here's a extension of that showing the distribution of, of wall stress where contrary to what you might think, the wall stress is actually greater on the lesser curvature than on the greater curvature and this tend, tends to be where the, uh, the intimal tears occur. So um, the, the, uh, the largest, uh, the biggest barrier to this technology is the ability to, to measure the wall thickness of the aorta with, with uh, CT scans and MRIs. And the, and the resolution of these devices is improving to the point where this is becoming reality and, and possible for us to do this. What about aortic flow measurements? Well, there's a lot of data which shows that the cellular constituents of the aorta are actually very sensitive to flow patterns within the aorta. So the endothelial cells inside the aorta are oriented a certain way and they are sensitive to the type of flow in the aorta, whether it be laminar or turbulent, and this actually can result in activation of maladaptive remodeling pro, uh, pro, um, uh, um, signaling that can progress to aneurysm formation. So here is, here is the so-called 4D flow maps from, uh, from, from MRIs. Here's a healthy volunteer that shows a laminar flow uh, across the aortic valve and then kind of a very gentle swirling pattern up the ascending and across the arch. But in this patient with Marfan's disease, you can see swirling in the left subclavian artery, swirling in the ascending. These are abnormal flow patterns and these, these patterns undoubtedly result in uh, maladaptive signaling um, through the activation of endothelial cells and other cellular constituents. And here's a, a close-up of this showing this vortex in the left subclavian, vortices in the ascending that shouldn't be there and then the descending. And these are areas uh, actually where, where aortic disease tends to be maximal in the proximal ascending and then also in the proximal descending. Similar pro, uh, flow patterns can be, uh, can be generated in type B dissections as well where you can see uh, flow in the um, true lumen and also in the false later on. Uh, bicuspid and tricuspid aortic valves are interesting. Here's a patient with a, a normal aortic valve and you can see that the flow in the ascending uh, and, and the root is largely laminar. In, in nature, but as soon as you impose a, a, an abnormal cusp pattern, such as that you will see in, in bicuspid uh, aortic valves, you'll see eccentric jets, which uh, abut against the surface of the aorta and these flow vortices, all of which I believe, and there's data to support this, that this contributes to maladaptive remodeling. So in terms of risk prediction for thoracic aortic disease, in general, we use aortic diameter and surrogates of it. Stress and flow algorithms are improving, but they're not mainstream by any, by any stretch. And, and still, we've had a difficult time relating this to any int intrinsic molecular biological properties. And so that brings me to a discussion on what is probably the primary protease system within the aorta, and that's the matrix metalloproteinase system. And this is a, uh, and, and to, to start this discussion, in general, when we think about aneurysm formation, we think about the extracellular matrix. This is the protein scaffold that houses the cells. And this scaffold gets remodeled in the, set, in the setting of aneurysm disease. So whatever the stimulus is, we get loss of smooth muscle cells, we get remodeling of this matrix, we get phenotype switching of smooth, smooth muscle cells and fibroblasts to more of an active myofibroblast phenotype. We have proteolysis, of the extracellular matrix and all of this weakens the aortic wall and results in this. So you can think of, um, of the proteolytic balance in thoracic aneurysms as a, a homeostasis between deposition of the matrix by cells and degradation by the enzyme systems. And in, 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 the, in, the, in the setting of an aneurysmal aorta, matrix de degradation exceeds deposition and it's this disruption of balance. That, that drives aneurysm uh, production. And what you end up with is you end up with these sorts of pictures. Here's a normal aorta here. Here's an aneurysmal uh, aorta cross section where you see these lakes of, of, uh, of proteoglycans residing within the media of the aorta, so-called cystic medial degeneration, which is a hallmark of many types of aneurysm disease. And so probably the primary protease family involved with, uh, with, with this pathologic remodeling is the matrix metalloproteinase family. It's a zinc-dependent zinc proteinase family of which there's 25 or 26 members. There are soluble and membrane-bound types. They're capable of degrading different types of substrates in the extracellular matrix, and they're naturally inhibited by four endogenous tissue inhibitors of the matrix metalloproteinases or TIMPs. They're found uh, in the vessel wall produced by all cell types 
and it's clear that dysregulated activity is linked to aneurysm production. The two probably most commonly studied are MMP2 and MMP9, and we have looked at these in a, in a significant amount in our laboratory. The, uh, the MMPs are classified in different types, different classes related to their substrate specificity and location within the cell. For example, all of these are secreted into the extracellular space, but the membrane type MMPs sit on the cell membrane and process the cell matrix interface. So in order to study these, when I first uh, started at MUSC in 2000, we started a, uh, a thoracic aneurysm model in which uh, we uh, do a thoracotomy on an anesthetized mouse, um, uh, isolate the descending thoracic aorta and then treat it with calcium chloride, which results in a, a slow but gradual dilatation of the descending thoracic aorta over time, descending thoracic aorta over time. And here are some photomicrographs showing the, the growth uh, over a, a four week period. And in some cases, we see these saccular aneurysms which have actually uh, progressed to rupture and some of the mice have died. So we've actually created a model which recapitulates the entire spectrum of uh, the natural history of aneurysm disease over a uh, 16 week or so um, uh, time period. And here uh, documents the change in aortic diameter over time and you can see that by 16 weeks we get to almost um, 80, 180% of baseline uh, diameter. So true aneurysms that we're studying. We were able to show uh, significant elevations in, in MMP9 um, in these uh, aneurysms and ask the question of whether or not they were important. And so we created aneurysms in a mouse that had, that had a genetic deletion for the MMP9 gene and were able to show that in those particular mice, we could abrogate aneurysm production. Uh, aortic diameter shown here the wild type mouse uh, baseline uh, with an aneurysm and then the uh, MMP9 knockout mouse at baseline and with an aneurysm, you can see that over a four week time period, the size of the aorta was significantly reduced. And similarly, we, uh, we used a mouse that had a genetic deletion for TIMP1, which is the primary inhibitor. And uh, according to what you might suspect, this resulted in actual progression in aneurysm size, a larger size at the equivalent time points, four and eight weeks, but also a, a, rap, a more rapid uh, increase in size. Um, we then took this to um, human specimens and uh, at MUSC, we house an ascending aortic aneurysm bank which is, which is uh, composed of pool samples from us, the University of Pennsylvania, Duke and Yale. And we are approaching 1,000 uh, ascending aortas in our bank, which, we used, um, which we've used to interrogate um, for various things. And one of those is for MMPs. And we have them stratified by bic patients with bicuspid valves, Marfans, and also uh, degenerative aneurysms. And so we, we did seek to look at differences between bicuspid aortopathy and tricuspid aortopathy. And, we, and our patient profiles here are um, 27 normal aortas which were taken from coronary bypass uh, and heart transplant recipients uh, and heart donors. 59 patients with bicuspid aortic valve associated aortopathy and 67 with tricuspid associated aortopathy. And we uh, developed a whole bank of these MMPs and we were able to show significantly, significant differences between the aneurysms from normal, which is shown in the dotted lines, but also in between classes. For example, here in the collagenase class, MMP13 was significantly different in the tricuspids than the bicuspids. Um, collagenated, collagenases are shown here with an elevation of MMP2 in the bicuspid aortic valve, which I'll talk about a little bit later. No difference in uh, MMP3 and 7, no difference in the elastase groups, but an increase in MT1 MMP in the tricuspid uh, aneurysm groups, another important MMP for aneurysm production. So, so we were able to, to demonstrate some some uh, specific patterns, some specific cassettes of MMPs, which are changed with, this very, with these various aneurysm types. And it's this kind of data that could help us approach pharmaceutical companies, companies to come up with um, specific inhibitors that inhibit only specific types of MMPs to mitigate complications. But this, um, with, with the bicuspid aortic valve group in particular, if there's one thing that you take away from this talk about MMP, MMPs, is the one that comes up time and time again with bicuspid aortic valves is MMP2. This might even end up on an exam at some point because it, this comes up time and time again when we, when we look at this kind of data. And it's interesting in, in this particular case that MMP2s are increased in the absence of MT1 MMP because M, MMP2 relies on MT1 MMP for activation through a complex system that involves two MT1 molecules and a TIMP2 molecule 
But in, the, in these particular groups, MT, MMP2 is elevated anyway. So this may suggest a novel mechanism that needs further study. Um, another thing that we did uh, was, uh, pertains to bicuspid aortopathy. And as you know, this is the most common congenital cardiac malformation, the bicuspid valve. It occurs in, in about 2% of the population. There are different fusion patterns. Um, and there is a clear association between the bicuspid aortic valve and ascending aortic aneurysms. But there's ongoing controversy regarding the proper timing for surgery with ascending aortic aneurysms associated with bicuspid aortic valves. And in fact, uh, as, as early as, a, as recently as a few months ago, there was yet again another revision of guidelines for the decision to operate on these patients. So we still really don't have this figured out. The current ACC guidelines say that greater than five and a half centimeters is recommended, but it's still a bit uncertain what to do when the ascending aortic aneurysm of greater than four and a half centimeters is encountered during an aortic valve replacement. Data that was already published showed that a histologic analysis of the ascending aorta in these patients showed increased matrix dis destruction when the aortic aneurysm was associated with the right to left cusp, cusp fusion pattern. And so we sought to see if we could correlate that biochemically. And so what we did was we, um, we, took, we went back to our bank and we took aneurysms from patients with bicuspid aortic valves and we stratified them by the cusp fusion pattern, left, right, right, left, and right, non. And we looked at various MMPs um, standardized by a TIMP score, which was TIMP 1, 3, and 4, because TIMP 2 is actually an activating uh, TIMP. And when we did that, we saw the largest number of abnormalities with the left-right fusion pattern compared with normal, which actually supported the histologic notion that there's greater, more aggressive remodeling in the aortopathy associated with right-left fusion. Now, um, for those of you who, who know this disease, you'll know that the right-left fusion is present in about 75% of patients. It's the most common fusion pattern, so we see this a lot. And the point of it is that if you're operating on a, doing an aortic valve on a patient um, with bicuspid disease, their aorta is a bit dilated. You open the aorta, it's a little bit, it's maybe thin and a bit friable. And you look and you see that there's a right-left fusion pattern. There is some biochemical and, and histological arguments for being a bit more aggressive about replacing that aorta than if the aorta was associated with a, a different cusp fusion pattern. So. Um, to summarize here, we know that uh, disruption of MMP and TIMP balance mechanistically is related to the development of thoracic aneurysms. Small animal models have been useful in defining these relationships, which to some extent have been confirmed in human aortic specimens. And this recurring relationship between MMP2 and bicuspid-associated uh, aortopathy is something that may come to the forefront. Now, um, I'm gonna move on now to talk a bit about biomarkers. So we have these, we have endo endovascular stent grafts. Um, they've been a fantastic technology and, and this technology is expanding. There are very specific patient uh, placement considerations, but they're still prone to complications like endo leaks, migration, stent fracture, uh, disease progression. In some series, in some patients, the incidence of endo leak can be as high as 30 30% late. So how do we track these patients? Well, we can track them with CT scans, but it turns out that you can also, also measure plasma MMPs on these patients and predict their endoleaks. So here's a study from abdominal aortas. Here's a study from thoracic aortas. Here we are looking at MMP9 and MMP3 and MMP9 here in the thoracic aorta. And you can see in patients that don't have endoleaks, their MMP um, abundance in plasma goes down over time. But with persistent endoleaks, there's a persistent elevation in MMPs, both in the abdominal aorta and also in the thoracic aorta, where, um, where we see a persistence in MMP9 in patients with endoleaks. So this could be a relatively inexpensive way to track these patients, very much like the way we used to track CEAs in uh, uh, following uh, colon cancer resection to, to point our investigations in those patients after, after resection. Um, and while we've shown that MMPs and TIMPs have shown promise as biomarkers for aortic disease, there's also been a lot of interest in upstream regulation, regulators of MMP expression, which brings us to a discussion of microRNAs. So microRNAs are a very large family of molecules that were first described in bacteria in 1993. They're non-coding RNA molecules of 20 to 25 nucleotides in length. They're found in widely disparate species, and there's at least 3,000 of these, different of these in the human genome. They have multiple functions. They can repress messages, uh, induce messages, 
uh, one, one mirror can target multiple mRNAs and one target mRNA can have multiple binding sites. And at least one third of expressed human genes contain mere regulatory sites. And so in very loose terms, this is how they're produced. We're in the nucleus, uh, there's transcription uh, that creates a, uh, a primary uh, miRNA molecule, which is then spliced and uh, ejected from the nucleus in a dimer form. And it is, it is uh, further processed into a dimer mirror which is shown here, one is the active strand and one is the inactive strand. This binds to a, a regulatory protein which results in ejection of the passenger, passenger strand binding to some other uh, proteins and you get an active mirror. And this has three possible interactions with mRNA. It can either um, uh, have a non-recognition in which uh, translation of the uh, mRNA to a final protein occurs un uninterrupted it can bind to the mRNA molecule and inhibit translation, or it can result in hmm, disruption of the mRNA molecule, complete degradation of it and inhibition of translation. One of the great things about these mirrors is that they can be exported and imported into new cells and they're very stable in plasma. So it's possible to process plasma and measure these in plasma. So they have potential value as biomarkers. They regulate, an, a large number of functions, cellular proliferation, apoptosis, cancer development, and the cardiovascular system, again, lots of different uh, functions and also potential relevance to thoracic aortic aneurysm disease. So we had the hypothesis that development of thoracic aneurysms is associated with changes in mere expression, which could be correlated to indices of aneurysm progression. So we went back to the tissue bank. We obtained aortic tissue from 30 patients of ascending aneurysms of varying sizes all tricuspid aortic valves, and we compared them to 10, 10 uh, normal patients. And then we measured um, a number of mirrors which are known to be active within the cardiovascular system. And, uh, and we also analyzed for MMP2 and 9. So here is the mirror expression. This is, these are, this is mirror expression in normal uh, aorta. And these are the mirror expression profiles in aneurysms. And all of the mirrors across the board were, were decreased, uh, except for mirror 760, which was not statistically significant. Mirror 208 was not detected, but this is a myocardial specific mirror. So we expected not to see this. This was kind of an internal control. So uh, if we had seen this, that would have been a problem. So we then went on to um, correlate mirror expression to uh, aneurysm size, and these are the, the different mirror types at the top, and you can see this very clean decrease in mirror uh, expression relative to aneurysm size. The larger the aorta got, the less mirror there was around. We then went to a, uh, a human scan database and looked for potential binding sites of these mirrors on transcripts for either MMP2 or MMP9, and we were able to find potential binding sites for MIR 29A and 133A. And it turns out that MMP2 in this same group increased in abundance as the aneurysms increased in size. And recall that MIR 29 decreased as the aneurysms increased in size. And when we performed a correlation analysis, there was a very, very strong correlation between the expression of MMP2 and the decrease in MIR 29A, indicating that this is a very important um, regulatory um, MIR in terms of the, uh, of the progression of aneurysms. We took this a step further then, and, uh, and we sought to identify circulating plasma factors that could distinguish and predict etiological subtypes of aneurysm disease. So we looked at uh, ascending um, aneurysm tissue and plasma, uh, com uh, um, obtained from patients with either bicuspid aortopathy or tricuspid aortopathy at the time of surgery. And then we looked at a panel of microRNAs, MMPs, and TIMPs with the, with the goal of coming up with, a, um, with a, uh, a, a prediction system of biomarkers for these. And so these are the results, and I apologize for this very busy slide. But what I'd like to bring to your attention is three things. The first is that um, from the slide, it can be seen that there is a very, very separate cassette of mirrors, MMPs, and TIMPs from normal aortas, which are indicated in the dotted lines. There is also uh, very significant differences between the bicuspid and tricuspid aortopathies, as indicated by some of these um, significant signals. And then lastly, one thing that was particularly important was that it was not possible to correlate tissue values to plasma values, with the exception of, of just four cases, MMP8, TIMP1, TIMP3, and TIMP4.
And so we sought then to, to calculate predictability of, uh, of thoracic aneurysms uh, with a forward regression analysis. And so use of, uh, of, of MIR-143 resulted uh, with, with a predictive index of 64%. And if we added MMP8 and 133A, we could predict uh, the presence of a thoracic aneurysm in a patient with 97% sensitivity. We did a similar analysis for the bicuspid aortic valve and notice with a, with a different cassette, including MMP2, as I mentioned before, we could predict the presence specifically of a bicuspid aortic aneurysm with 98% sensitivity. Similar with MMP2, 143, and MMP8 for the tricuspid. So the conclusions from this were that, is that there are definitely distinct biochemical signatures that we can measure in the plasma of patients with aneurysms that we can use to predict um, their presence, and that, um, and that these do not agree with tissue measurements, and that likely a single analyte will not be uh, sufficient. We'll have to use a multi-analyte assay. And it's, it's worth, I throw this up just to show that, that the idea of biomarkers in thoracic aortic disease is not novel. There have been a number of biomarkers that have been looked at, and we continue to try and, and, and hone this down so that we can use this clinically. Now, one, one thing that will be very important is to make the transition from the animal models to human. It would be good to, good to have a larger animal model to study this. And in our laboratory, we've uh, developed a, a porcine aortic model of thoracic aortic disease. Here's a control uh, pig MRI and 3D reconstruction. And then here is a, a pig that was, uh, that, whose descending aorta was treated with um, a mixture of collagenase and calcium chloride. And you can see that we have a very definite aneurysm here. And if you treat this with a um, short-acting radio-labeled MMP inhibitor, you can see that it localizes right in the area of the aneurysm, but nowhere else in the aorta, indicating that we have MMP activity that's, that's escalated in the aneurysm, but not elsewhere in the aorta. So this is something that we hope to uh, study further. So where are we with pharm pharmacologic therapy? Well, um, we know that MMPs are, are well shown to be directly responsible for aneurysm growth. And um, the treatment potential of these is limited by side effects, especially associated with global inhibitors. And um, there has been a lot of interest in, in a te tetracycline antibiotic, doxycycline, with global inhibitory properties. Up until this point, medical therapy for aneurysms is really just consists of, consisted of beta blockers, which shows a modest but real reduction in the, in the progression of aneurysm disease. But uh, more recent literature in animal models has indicated that doxycycline applied to animal models of aneurysm disease can abrogate the progression of aneurysms. And so um, here's an example uh, in a mouse model where it is possible to show that um, as doxycycline doses and plasma levels increase, you can decrease aneurysm size over time. So um, the first trial of doxycycline was published in 2001 in a, a relatively small group of patients. And uh, the, the patients were given 150 milligrams of doxycycline per day. And what we were able to show was no actual ab absolute difference in aneurysm size, but a change in the rate of progression of aneurysms over time, um, which was decreased in the doxycycline group compared, compared to placebo. Um, there, this, uh, and this is a discussion of this. Um, there was a medical, this, uh, this doxycycline pilot trial was conducted by Tim Baxter at the University of uh, Nebraska. Patients aged about 70. Um, these were the initial and final diameters, the doxy plasma levels, and he was able to show that plasma MMP9 levels decreased 63% over time with excellent compliance. And you can see um, a decrease in MMP9 level um, in the plasma and um, a really non-statistically significant change in aneurysm size over this time. And so um, subsequent to this, there was a larger trial from the Netherlands, uh, a prospective blinded doxycycline placebo trial, 14 hospitals in, in Holland where um, the aneurysms were 3.5 or 5 or larger but unfit for repair. The primary outcome was increase in AP diameter at 18 months done by ultrasound. And this was, a intention to, this was not an intention to treat analysis. And what this showed was 18 months of 100 milligrams a day of doxycycline did not influence the need for uh, aortic aneurysm repair or time to repair. But um, here in the United States, we've, we've embarked on a separate NIH-sponsored trial 
And uh, this trial is going to be conducted, is being conducted in 15 centers with uh, greater than 600 eligible patients, 125 randomized to either doxycycline or placebo. And um, there are some differences from this trial than the Dutch trial. There's a, a difference in patient number, an increase in the doxy dose compared to the, the, the Dutch trial. And also the fact that we're gonna use CTs to measure abdominal uh, aortic aneurysm size as opposed to ultrasound, which this is probably more sensitive and specific. And also uh, biomarkers and drug levels are being done, which may end up being the most important thing that comes out of this trial. Now, what about uh, angiotensin uh, converting enzyme inhibitors? Well, there are um, a number of studies which show that ACE inhibitors um, contribute to inhibition of uh, aneurysms. And uh, in England, uh, Janet Powell has just completed recruitment on aardvark, aortic aneurysm regression of dilatation value of ACE inhib inhibition on risks. And so this is 227 uh, uh, patients randomized to perindopril um, uh, versus uh, amlodipine versus placebo. And we're awaiting uh, results of this trial. Um, there's also evidence for the role of angiotensin re receptor blockers in, in uh, in abdominal aneurysms, and uh, probably Alan Doherty has done more work on this than anybody uh, in the country in his uh, in his mice. And um, there's the Teddy trial, which is actually be which is actually based here at Stanford by Dr. Dahlman, um, which is uh, in inhibition with telomisartan, uh, biomarkers and quality of life surveys. 300 patients followed with duplex uh, studies for two years, and so we're gonna be interested in the results of that study. And then um, there are uh, interleukin-1 beta and interleukin-1 uh, receptor blocker studies, which are being conducted in different institutions, most notably the University of Virginia. Um, there's been a lot of interest in Marfan syndrome and the uh, pathophysiology of Marfan syndrome. And as you know, this is a congenital disorder that, uh, that afflicts 0.2% of the population. Um, the primary uh, problem is a mutation with the fibrillin-1 gene, which is located uh, on 15Q21, and it results in a functional loss of the fibrillin-1 protein, which then results in, uh, in the uh, spectrum of abnormalities that we know about Marfan syndrome. Greater than 50% of these patients will develop aortic aneurysms and dissections that contribute significantly to their mortality uh, and morbidity. The only, um, the only pharmacologic agent that we have that uh, decreases the, pro the progression of aneurysms in Marfans is beta blockers. And this was the pivotal study published in the New England Journal in 1994, which shows a decrease um, in the in aortic size, uh, root size compared to the ascending in patients uh, with Marfan syndrome. And since that time, we really have not um, had any uh, any advancements until relatively recently when a, uh, a signaling molecule called transforming growth factor beta or TGF beta was shown to be potentially involved. This is a, uh, a super family of molecules. Uh, it's a soluble peptide growth factor that's produced by many cell types and it participates in a wide array of cellular responses but the most common is fibrosis. This tends to be a pro-fibrotic molecule when it's present um, uh, collagen is usually laid down. The classical pathway involves binding of uh, TGF beta to a um, to a uh, a dimer of receptors, which then uh, results in autophosphorylation and the activation of these chaperone proteins called SMADs, and these then uh, translocate to the nucleus and initiate transcription and uh, new protein um, new protein formation. There are 30 different ligands. There are all kinds of different receptors in SMAD, so this is a huge family. This is a real conundrum to study. But in 2006, Hal Dietz published a landmark study in which he was able to show that, uh, that TGF-beta inhibition resulted in um, abrogation of root dilatation in mice that were genetically engineered without the fibrillin gene. And so uh, Losartan, an angiotensin receptor blocker which has idiosyncratic TGF-beta inhibitory properties was shown to decrease aortic root growth. And he was able to then go on further to show that if he used a specific antibody against TGF-beta, he was able to show the same result. Um, a small trial at this point uh, with angiotensin receptor blockers showed a change in the progression 
the suggestion of the change in, in the progression of root diameter dilatation, which then formed the nidus for uh, a number of randomized trials of losartan versus beta blocker um, in a number of countries. The one that was undertaken here, um, based at Hopkins, but in a number of centers across the United States, uh, of which the principal investigator was Dr. Dietz, was in 608 patients aged six months to 25 years, and it randomized a tenolol versus losartan with echocardiographic assessments of the aortic root. And what this unfortunately showed was that there was really no difference in aortic root Z-score or diameter between the patients treated with the tenolol and losartan over time. Some, some criticized the study saying that the groups were not appropriate, that what the groups really should have been was beta blocker and beta blocker plus losartan instead of separating them out. But the study is what the study is. There was another study called the COMPARE trial with uh, looking at COZAR. Um, with losartan in 233 adult patients. This particular study was positive in the sense that there was um, an abrogation in aortic root dilatation rate, both by MRI and transthoracic echo. Um, the most recent study published in the European Heart Journal looked at, once again, a tenolol versus losartan, and again, was negative. So. The, the jury on losartan is still out. Uh, I think many physicians are putting patients on losartan now. Some, some are treating patients with doxycycline, but the actual evidence base for that is pretty scant at the present time. So in conclusion, in general, I think that there has been some progress made in various areas related to aortic disease, but our current risk stratification modalities are disappointing. There are multi-center trials underway evaluating promising new pharmacology but we still have a number of challenges. Aortic disease is still relatively rare. There's an absence of specific inhibitors to reduce the complications associated with them, a lack of appropriate large animal models to test mechanisms. Lots of questions that, st that still need to be answered, and, uh, and uh, this is a very valuable area for study for a lot of us. So I'd like to thank you very much for your time and your attention. I'd be pleased to answer any questions. for that very comprehensive translational talk. Do we have any questions from the audience? Um, yeah, I think I think that's uh, an excellent question, and I think maybe part of the answer could come from some of our knockout studies, where if you actually eliminate the gene, you can reduce aneurysm progression. So I would like to think that um, that they are playing a mechanistic part, um, but it, but it's complicated. You know, I don't think it, it's just about MMPs alone. I think that I think that part of it has to do with the change in cellular composition of the aorta. I think that at least in our hands, we've seen that. Um, the fibroblast emerges as the primary cell type and that the smooth muscle cell decreases in, in number and that the fibroblast changes from a relatively dormant cell to actually a, a rather metabolically active cell. Now, there are other investigators that would stand right here and tell you that it's the smooth muscle cell that's the culprit and not the fibroblast. We have, and it might be a combination of the two. But I would like to think, and I think that there is data to support the notion that MMP2s have a primary mechanistic role. That role could be not just proteolysis, but also activation of enzyme systems. So we're currently looking at MT1 MMP, a membrane-based MMP, which has a role in activating MMP2 and has a proteolytic role. But it's a very interesting molecule because it undergoes cellular cycling. It gets sucked into the cell and it's processed within the cell and then ejected. And while it's in the cell, it may serve to activate um, other intracellular pathways. So, so it's, it's a complex thing that still hasn't quite been worked out.
Sure, well, we've been able to do that um, with tricuspid aneurysms. We've been able to predict that on the basis of size. And as I indicated to you, um, if you know the cusp fusion pattern, um, there, there are biochemical correlates which argue in favor of early replacement. Um, so I, I think it would be possible to have sort of a desktop tool where you could put a drop of blood uh, in, in a small machine and have a printout very similar to what you're talking about. I think that's something that's not outside the realm of possibility. Honestly not, no. Uh, I haven't seen a bicuspid, a patient with bicuspid aortopathy that did not have elevated MMPs. Hello. Their, um, their profiles, you, you can, you, it is possible to measure, uh, because we've done this, we've taken strips of aorta during aortic valve replacement where the aorta is relatively normal, so we've been able to do that. And they're, they're, they're different. The MMP, the MMP values are higher. They're not as high with patients with aneurysm. It's actually, there's a very interesting linear correlation uh, that you can generate with aneurysm size that, that I think has significance. Ms. Sanford. I, I do, absolutely, and in fact, we've been able to show um, uh, a, a very specific correlation in static samples, of course, um, from different patients. So, you know, the data I showed you with different aneurysm sizes, those are aneurysms from different patients, uh, which is why we really need um, a system like a large animal model where we can take serial blood samples, and in a pig, we could put like a, you know, a tunneled, a tunneled port, and, and actually, as the aneurysm's growing, we can take serial blood samples and follow this. But in static samples from different patients, we can clearly correlate an aneurysm size to, an, to a microRNA level. And what we've seen is that the larger the aneurysm gets, the more suppression of microRNAs you see, generally is what we've seen. Is there any progress being made with in situ molecular imaging of a patient with a known or small aneurysm? They're trying to predict the likelihood that this patient has a dissection. Is there a way to image and determine MMP activation? Yes, there is, and there are some radio, uh, there are some nuclear and radio labeled short acting, acting MMP inhibitors that will serve that function. And um, in my capacity as a, as a study section um, participant at the NIH, I can tell you that there are a number of uh, there are a number of grants coming through now um, looking at specifically that in patients. Um, there, there's, but there are no large animal models. We're basically transitioning from the mouse and the rat to the human. The animal models have been challenging. And, uh, you know, ours, ours is, for those of you that do animal research, you know that they're expensive and, uh, and we've, we're trying to, uh, to create a platform where we can study that in more detail. But, but, but that technology does exist, definitely. Yes. Who is this guy? <laughs> um, awesome question, really. And uh, and you know, I didn't really want to get too much. I I, I alluded no, 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 not at all. I alluded to the paradox with TGF beta. It's a primarily a fibrotic pathway, right? So so how does TGF beta activate MMPs? Is your question? Yeah. So. Um, you have to read between the lines in, in the data that's, that's available from us and others. There are different ways that, MM, that, that TGF betas exert their signaling. They're canonical activation pathways, which primarily are pro-fibrotic, but there's some of these non-canonic pathways. Instead of the TGF beta one and two receptors, there's the, there's the ALK1 receptor, which, which really activates a completely different signaling stream that will be linked to MMP production. So there is a mechanism. In fact, Hal published a paper that showed that he thought that TGF beta was working through non-canonical signaling. Yeah. So I, I hope that answered your question for you. Oh, 